Planet Earth, it's the only home we've ever known. But we can't stay here forever. Because whether it's due to climate change, killer asteroids, or some other horrifying disaster, Earth is going to die. Eventually. The good news is, we're in the middle of a new space race. By the mid-2030s, I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. One fueled by explorers looking to get rich on new worlds. Call it Space 2.0. I think it would look great on our resume. You know, we went to the planet next door and we helped establish life on it. These entrepreneurs have cosmic wealth in mind. I believe that the first trillionaires will actually be generated by investments in space resources. But they also hope to build the foundation for human settlement on the moon, Mars, and beyond. One of the most controversial of these space startups is Mars One, founded by former energy entrepreneur Baz Lonsdorp. Mars One is a not-for-profit foundation that will land the first humans on Mars in the year 2025. Everybody, when you first tell them about our plan, uh, their reaction is, uh, is, is this serious? Imagine what my mom said when I moved from a wind energy company to a mission to Mars company. Any new idea attracts first uh, laughs, then frowns, and then applause. So that's actually part of what I like. It's convincing people step by step that uh, what we're working on is actually feasible. Mars One will establish human settlement on Mars in 2023. In that year, the first group of four humans will land on Mars. Every two years after that, another group will join the settlement. Mars One started in 2011. We've been working now for three years to basically set the basis of the company. Uh, we've started our selection process with more than 200,000 people who have applied to go to Mars. I think it was the most successful uh, job vacancy ever. Uh, we have uh, Lockheed Martin under contract for our first unmanned mission, which will happen in 2018. Uh, it's going to be a demonstration mission that will demonstrate some of the technologies that we need for the human mission. Two years later, in 2020, we're going to send our first rover to Mars, uh, which will drive around in the region where we expect the settlement to be. In 2022, we're sending all the hardware for the mission. So that's uh, two life support units, two living units, uh, a spare rover and a supply unit. The two rovers will move all the equipment to the location of the outpost, activate the life support systems. And when all this is in place, the first crew will depart in 2024, landing on Mars in 2025. We can uh, design a mission with an acceptable risk because we don't have to implement the return mission because that is really where the risks are. It is a mission of permanent settlement. You're not coming back. It's a compelling vision, sure. It's also estimated to cost upwards of $6 billion for just the first flight. Mars One hopes to pay the bulk of this tab by creating the biggest reality show in TV history. For me, it was always evident that technically it's possible to send humans to Mars and to have them survive there. But I could never figure out how to finance it until I saw the revenue numbers of the Olympic Games. So when I realized that our eyeballs are worth more than one billion dollar per week, then I realized that you can finance a human mission to Mars from the broadcasting rights and the sponsorships. People will watch this for decades. And it's different from the Apollo missions, for example, because they're not test pilots that came out of nowhere and suddenly they're, they're the moon astronauts. These are people that we all will have seen as they train, as they are selected, as they uh, depart. So it's our TV friends that will be going to Mars. We will know them. Hi, my name is Kelly Girardi and I'm applying for Mars One. Kelly Girardi is a consultant for several commercial space companies and hopes to travel off Earth as soon as possible, even if that means a risky one-way trip with Mars One. I want to go to Mars because one, I believe that it's crucial for us to have manned exploration of Mars as a planet. And two, I believe in leading by example. And obviously my fiance is really lenient with the amount of space crap that I bring into the apartment. I mean, I don't know how many other people would tolerate this much of a theme. Um, one of the most incredible moments of 
my time in the commercial space industry was sitting down with Stephen Hawking and that was a really special moment. You know, I was jabbering like an idiot talking about how I want to go to Mars and I love working in the commercial space industry and he uh, was really kind to sort of tell me, you know, to boldly go and sort of dedicate that little keynote to me. So I, I, I could not have been more honored. Kelly's entry video helped her reach the second round of the Mars One selection process, which has called the list of 200,000 applicants down to around 700. Thanks for your consideration. See you soon. If you are one of the people that's, uh, that want to go on this mission of permanent settlement, then it's not at all something that has a negative association. Uh, we have actually uh, heard applicants say, if this was a return mission, I would not have applied. For the people that want to migrate to Mars, it's basically the same as it was for people who were migrating to Australia 100 years ago. You were also selling everything you had here on Earth. You bought a one-way ticket on the boat to Australia and you, you went to Australia, you never returned. But these are explorers, this is what they do. They want to go to places where not many or no humans have gone before. I applied as a candidate along with 200,000 other people, which should just go to show how much interest there really is in space exploration. And I guarantee not all of those people even read the fine print. They were like, mm, one-way trip, Mars, check, check. <laughs> you know, and there's, there's something great about that. There's an inherent excitement that, that we can harness. And it's really important to create that connection between the average citizen and space because right now there's, you know, wh why should we care? Why do we give a shit about space? So to do that, I think we need to create opportunity for everyone in space. And that comes with democratizing space and allowing every single person in this country to see space as a possible opportunity for them. The fact remains that we have technology capable of launching to Mars and that alone is incredibly exciting and it goes to show why 200,000 people signed up for this in the first place because they saw themselves, they saw something in that project and related it to themselves and wanted to be a part of it. Stephen Hawking once said that without leaving this earth we would be like castaways on a desert island and I really believe that in the entire history of mankind less than 600 people have ever been to space. And that's outrageous. In the next few years alone, we're going to double that number with commercial tourism. Yeah, so are you the new face of space travel? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, you know, that would be really flattering and awesome. But I, I think anyone can be the new face of space travel. And I think that's the point. Is that she may be right. No but trying to leave Earth on Mars One is still a huge long shot. If you want to go to space anytime soon, your best bet is to be super rich. Behind me is a terminal for Spaceport America, which already counts a number of tenants, including space flight leaders Virgin Galactic and SpaceX. It's pretty cool to see us coming out of the desert because this is the way that we're gonna get off Earth. So this is a Virgin Galactic spaceship too. It's, this is a replica of the actual craft, but it's full size. And as soon as you walk up to it, it's kind of surprising to think, this thing isn't really that big. It's supposed to carry four to six passengers, and to think that you have people that are willing to spend, you know, $200,000, $250,000 for a ticket is pretty incredible. But that's what it takes to be an early adopter and really start building this industry. And eventually over time, it's gonna end up growing and having more and more people get into this. Um, but in the meantime, it's kind of like hopping in a tiny airplane and then getting launched on a rocket into space. This will be carried by White Knight 2, which is the carrier craft. They will get to about 50,000 feet. At about 50,000 feet, the spaceship will drop down. Then the engines ignite, and then it goes by itself up to about 350,000 feet. At that altitude, then, the passengers can take their seatbelts off. They can float around the cabin. They'll be able to see the curvature of the Earth. It's going to be quite an experience for people. 
I think they've sold over 700 tickets now. And yes, over time, just like everything else, you know, in the first TVs, the first computers, everything, I mean, it, the prices will certainly come down so that people like us can go, you know, and eventually, right now it's uh, suborbital, but eventually all the companies are looking toward orbital travel, you know, and point-to-point -point travel, and then, of course, uh, other planets as well. I know we'll get to Mars, I know there'll be colonization of Mars, but how many years that will take to do that, uh, you know, it's anybody's guess. Mars is in the future, but in the near term, the vision of point-to-point -point travel that Christine is referring to is the idea that a growing network of spaceports will connect tourists across the globe, much like the early days of air travel. Spaceport America's Mission Control Building is located a short drive from the Virgin Galactic Terminal. You can look at Spaceport America as a small city. We're in the fire station. Again, this is an important part of a commercial spaceport. And because we are so remote, we have to have our own equipment and our own firemen and emergency medical folks. Upstairs is Mission Control. These two large touchscreens control nearly everything at the spaceport and allow just two operators to do what used to take an entire room full of NASA engineers. You know, you saw the old Apollo movies and you saw the big mission control with the rows and rows of desks and all the people. Well, you can do that job today with like two people. I mean, that's where you do that. So you can control the world from up here, basically. And we're setting the bar here. This is the first purpose-built spaceport. So we wanted it to be very futuristic. So even the console, we thought, well, we want it to look kind of Star Trek-y. Now, commercial space flights here haven't quite opened for business yet, but after seeing and being able to put our hands on something that's actually tangible, it's clear that we're so close to being able to take trips into space. Tourism is a first step to making space more accessible. The next step requires figuring out how to build entire industries off-world. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Good. Let's see. Is that... Cool. Have thank you. Little... All right, thank you. We're at NASA's Ames Research Center, which is home to both NASA research facilities as well as a bunch of private space companies. It's kind of like the epicenter of the new commercial space industry, as well as a throwback to the early days of NASA's work. This unassuming office is home to Moon Express, a startup that hopes to be the first private company to land on and mine the moon. I believe that the first trillionaires will actually be generated by investments in space resources. Moon Express CEO Bob Richards thinks space mining could dwarf any industry on Earth. The long-term vision of Moon Express is to open up the economic resources of the Moon to unlock its mysteries and provide its benefits back to planet Earth and to our expanding civilization in space. That's the big vision. But the key from a business perspective is how do you get there? How do you bridge to that huge vision? The ability for a small team of engineers like Moon Express to be able to take on what only superpowers have been able to do in the past is because of exponential technology. We're going from the mainframe era of space, which was large government-centric, to the PC era. So you don't have to have massive amounts of hardware anymore. You can dematerialize that into software. We don't have to kill the Earth in order to live. We can go to the moon where there's no biosphere, there's no life, but there's resources there. We're not going to be displacing any tall blue people that we know about. And it's a realm of opportunity for us to work together as a species to conquer a new frontier without conquering each other. The wonderful random circumstance we have as a species that we live on a world that has another world really close. And it's so cl relatively close, it's not inconsistent to think of the journey to the moon today as like the journey to the Americas of only a few hundred years ago. It was a big challenge. People made a decision to really try to open up a new world. We're doing the same thing with the moon. Why? Because everything that we mine on Earth and need as, in, as an industrial civilization is available on the moon. Why? Because the moon and the Earth evolved together. Both were bombarded by asteroids for billions of years in their early history. In the case of the Earth, very large world, very molten. And the asteroids are kind of splashing and, and a lot of the heavy metals we have that we have to dig for are, are buried very deep in the Earth because they kind of sunk. The moon is a little different. It cooled much faster. So it's kind of a hard rock that these asteroids were hitting. And in many cases, not just vaporizing, but shattering. 
And imagine the trillions of dollars of wealth that's accumulated in the moon over those billions of years. It's there. Every average heavy metal asteroid that's out there contains about a trillion dollars worth of precious metals. They've been accumulating on the moon for a long, long time, so that's where we're going. We think the pay dirt for these trillions of dollars worth of asteroidal resources are actually on the moon, and our investors believe so too. And so Moon Express has a plan to start delivering cargo, scientific and commercial instruments to the surface of the moon with robots, and have people pay for that. And as we learn how to land on the moon and we take advantages of those missions to explore the moon and find out where the ground truth is of the resources we know are there, then we'll be able to plan further and explore, prospect, and eventually bring something back from the moon. Just across a parking lot in the shadow of a former blimp hangar is one of Moon Express's test facilities. Yeah, this is the hover test facility where we used to test our hover test vehicle. The idea behind this was that it was this uh, common spacecraft bus and it was a, a modular spacecraft. If you wanted a lander or an orbiter or any sort of spacecraft, you'd say, oh, well, I've got a bunch of carbon on the shelf, I'll just you know, yeah. kind of put this erector set together. Oh, cool. And it's over-designed for certain things, but it's able to be used for a lot of things. We did uh, static fire tests, we did tests, tests on a tether, we did tests on a, on a bungee cord, and then finally we did free flight tests. So this is the model of the lander that you guys are building right now. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty simple. I mean, basically, this is just a mock-up of the robot that we're sending to the moon. And we want to build a test vehicle so that we can practice flying, mm -hmm. just like you would practice driving a car before you go on the highway. And we want to be able to fly instead of crawl or, or slide or do something like that. Sometimes it dawns on you that you're working for a company going to the moon, <laughs> right? And yeah. it dawns on you particularly when the moon is just like, right above the horizon and you're driving home or you're driving to work and you're like, yeah. Five, four, three, two, one. Main engine ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V rocket with LRO Elcross, America's first step of a lasting return to the moon. In 2009, NASA launched the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. One of its primary objectives was to find evidence of water on the moon's poles, which it did. The discovery is vital to Moon Express's plan. The economics of the moon is made possible through water on the moon. Think of water as the oil of the solar system. Its constituents, hydrogen and oxygen, are actually rocket fuel. And only water gives you the opportunity to create the fuel necessary to bring those resources off the lunar surface. So the first thing that Moon Express will be doing is actually learning how to mine and process the water on the moon. We're looking for our first gusher. And we know that that's likely going to come from the south pole of the moon where most of the water's been accumulating in ices. And that's in the matter of the next five to 10 years. We're not talking decades out. So our goal is, uh, is in 2020, we'll bring something back you can hold in your hand, something between two to six kilograms of stuff could be worth upwards of a billion dollars and then the game is on. And this will be rehearsal for Mars. So the water on the moon creates the fuel that changes the economics, not just of the moon, but the entire solar system. It's just a little component of a very large tapestry of the world of we humans becoming a multi-world species. And this is absolutely essential for our ultimate survival. Just around the corner is Made in Space, a startup that aims to bring manufacturing to the cosmos by sending zero-gravity 3D printers to the International Space Station. Our facility here will act as mission control, so we'll actually be able to operate the printer from our ground station here. Um, it's all like kind of like a remote desktop. Obviously, it's a bit different than a commercial type of 3D printer, and the reason why is it's designed not just to work in zero gravity, but it's also designed to be extremely safe and, and reliable. So a lot of the system is modular. If electronics fail, instead of having to wait to launch more, we will have spares and we can just unhook a cable and pop in a new one. Before sending their 3D printer to space, the company tested it in microgravity aboard several parabolic flights on NASA's famed Vomit Comet. So our first contract with NASA was actually they provided us 
with a, a set of microgravity flights. Because at first the off-the-shelf printers didn't work as is, but through these parabolas, you know, you have about 20 seconds of microgravity time, we learned how to adapt them for space. CRS-4 is underway. A U.S. commercial spacecraft launching from American soil delivers new science and technology to the International Space Station. In a sign of just how mature the commercial space industry is becoming, Made in Space's first machine was launched to the ISS on September 20th, 2014, aboard SpaceX's CRS-4 mission. Space is extremely, extremely expensive. Basically, the cost to get a you know, launch vehicle into orbit you're talking about you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, a pound, which is why the International Space Station um, is going to cost $100 billion plus you know, in, in its lifetime. So when you start building there on demand and kind of just iterate on the fly, you can bring the cost significantly down even without decreasing you know, the mass. We've seen examples where entire experiments have been shut down for a little pipe fitting uh, that cost millions of dollars for an experiment that we could have printed in literally a couple hours. So you're talking about completely changing how we do supply chain to space. It's a huge milestone for humanity. It's also small compared to our actual vision of building you know, settlements and eventually even cities on the moon, Mars, and beyond. The long game for many space companies is to develop a permanent presence on Mars. But before that happens, we have to ask a key question. Isn't the red planet a dead planet? Mars is like a dead body, recently dead, only a few billion years ago. If we do CPR on it, we can bring it back to life. We visited NASA astrobiologist Chris McKay to learn more. This is a prototype where we're basically building what we want to send to the moon. In the bottom, you can see uh, a bunch of little plants. Yeah, they're all growing up in there. Exactly, they've been growing for about a week. That's about how long we'd like to have them grow on the moon. So I'm interested in life, and for me, there's two aspects to life. There's the search for life out there. Is there life on other worlds? And secondly, can life from Earth be spread? So what we have been focusing on more immediately is sending plants to Mars. We've been designing a small greenhouse the size of a coffee can. And in that greenhouse, we would put in a couple hundred seeds. We'd send it to Mars and just see if they grow. Very, very simple. It's a baby step. When we look at the other worlds in our solar system, none of them are very good for life at all. But Mars is in kind of a funny gray zone. It's not good for life, but we think it once was good for life, and we think that we could make it good for life in the future. None of the other worlds in our solar system are even close. They're like rocks. There's no way to bring them back to life. You can do all the CPR you want on a rock, and it's not going to come to life. And it, it turns out, the fundamental challenge of making Mars habitable is warming the planet. Well, we know how to warm planets. We're doing it on Earth. It's ironic, but the things we're doing on Earth, which are probably not a good idea, are exactly the things we would do to resuscitate Mars. So I see the idea of terraforming Mars, making it a planet suitable for life, as something that we could consider doing right now on timescales that are human timescales, 100 years or so, you can imagine Mars being warm with forests. I think it would look great on our resume. You know, we went to the planet next door and we helped establish life on it. It appears that everyone wants to get to Mars, from NASA to private companies to adventurers like Kelly, who we met up with again at New York City's famed Explorers Club. If the trip is successful, it's still a one-way trip. Like, I mean, right. you're going to die on Mars. Like, what does that, what does it even mean to you? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, when people say you're going to die on Mars, it's sort of like, you know, I grew up in Florida and I moved out of the state, and now I'm going to, like, maybe die in New York. And it's just one of those things, like, you constantly push forward, whether it's in life or whether it's, uh, you know, as a species, we're progressing. Kelly's an explorer at heart and understands and accepts the risks. But there's no getting past the fact that it's a one-way trip. And the trip may be shorter than anyone anticipated. An extensive new report from MIT researchers was particularly damning of Mars One's current plan, finding that the goal of growing plants on site to feed Mars One astronauts, rather than packing food from Earth, would wreak havoc on their habitat's atmosphere. The researchers did note that Mars One's technology is still in development, and that they hope we soon are able to colonize Mars. Still, in one model, the first crew fatality came within just 68 days. But despite criticism, Mars One CEO Boz Lonsdorp is confident that in 10 years, his team can successfully get a crew to Mars. 
if there was ever something that I felt we could not overcome, then I would immediately stop and uh, start one of the many other ideas that I have. I'm a real entrepreneur. Eh? I see opportunity, I see risk, and I weigh both of them and decide to do it or not. Whether or not Mars One is able to meet its goals, they'll still have accomplished something extraordinary by contributing to a global conversation about space settlement. We're still in the early days of space exploration, and few companies with their eyes on Mars are actually going to make it there. But I think Kelly said it best. No matter what, no matter who it's with, I will go to space one day. And you guys can too. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>